Dr. Mark Nolan is an associate professor in the Australian National University's College of Law, where he has worked since 2002. Mark generously agreed to be interviewed on the topic of how the law construes and deals with unknowns. Mark, the, the, there's the old saying that ignorance of the law is no excuse. What does that actually mean? It does have quite a technical meaning in one area of the criminal law. For most criminal offences, you need a guilty mind and a guilty act. They have to go together to lead to a successful prosecution. But so, for some offences, we allow the government to say, you will be guilty if you just did the guilty act. They're called strict liability offences. Mm. Now, what's startling here is that you can't say, that's not what I meant to do at the time. There's no inquiry about the guilt that was in your mind at the time. But there is a defence. And that defence allows you to argue that you were mistaken as to facts. But it doesn't allow you to argue you were mistaken as to, the fact, as to law. You can't say, I didn't know the law. I didn't know this was a crime. I didn't know this was a guilty act. So that's where the phrase, ignorance of the law is no excuse, could come from in the criminal law as well. Mm -hmm. um, an example? Um, let's say I go on sabbatical as an academic to a university. I'm not familiar with that university. I arrive every day at the university and put money in a parking meter. Put that ticket from the parking meter on my car and go about my day. And I do this many times. It comes to the attention of the authorities that that's what I've been doing. And they give me a fine for not paying parking fees. I think I've paid parking fees. But what I've done is I've put money in a parking meter that belongs to the local council rather than a parking meter that belongs to the University of Exeter. I've made a mistake as to facts. I thought this is certainly the parking meter that I need to put my money in, but it wasn't. In that case, I could raise this defense of honest and reasonable mistake of fact, as it's called. And even though the crime is a crime where the guilty act is enough, I can raise that and get a um, defence. But I can't say I didn't know that I had to put money in parking metres. And this, this actually happened to you, right? So I paid the fine, yeah. Gabrielle. I didn't think that it was worth arguing that quite controversial point in a magistrate's court in the UK a few days before I left the jurisdiction. But that's, that's one example of where the law definitely does say ignorance of the law is no excuse because there is only one mistake that you can make, and that's as to facts. I put money in one parking meter, and I should have put it in the other parking meter. Mm. So there's a lot of um, area of interpretation in the law that's also quite problematic. Can you say a little bit about that? Well, most of it's when we attempt to write down the law and use written laws as if they were certain and clear and don't need any interpretation. Most of the time the problems arise because we don't anticipate the various ways in which the law will be used. So we might have an example of a law where we try to prohibit something, but we haven't thought about all the different circumstances in which it might be useful to assert that law against someone's behaviour. Let's say, as by way of an example, the law says you can't um, drive a vehicle drunk. And the facts that come before you is that someone was riding a push bike on the ANU campus, drunk, and has hit someone, hurt someone, been involved in a car accident maybe. Does that law that you can't drive a vehicle drunk apply to a person who rides a bicycle drunk? What about a horse? What about a scooter? What about rollerblades? Whatever. <laughs> so you can see how easily um, the intention of Parliament to stop vehicles of all sorts harming pedestrians might become problematic depending on what you write down. So the more we try to get exact with the law and write it down, often the more uncertainty arises and the, the need for interpretation is important. Okay, well, what about um, the use of uh, precedents? Um, do any uncertainties or unknowns arise in that? I mean, my lay understanding of this is that uh, a magistrate might refer to a case that came before that is sufficiently similar to the one that, uh, that 
he or she is judging now and, and use that as, a, as a, um, uh, a guide to coming to a judgment. Absolutely. So in a common law system where the law is not written down so much in legislation, but we use historical cases to define what a legal concept is, it's all about arguing the uncertainties, the extension of the concepts. Um, let's use assault for an example. If I were to, to punch you against your will with no consent and I intended or I was somewhat careless or reckless as to whether I would contact your body, that would be an assault crime. In New South Wales, the word assault is used in legislation, but no other definition of that, that concept is used. So we go back to common law judge made understanding of what assault means. From the 1800s right through to today, we follow the way in which people try to define the certainties and the uncertainties around that concept of what assault is. What are some of the uncertainties? Um, what if I punch you um, and you suffer physical damage? Well, that's quite clear. That's what assault is. What if I, I threaten you, not even touch your body, and you suffer a psychological reaction to that? Um, some type of trauma, some type of distress that lasts over time. Is that what assault law covers? So even today in New South Wales, whether assault can be a charge when someone has pure mental harm is all judge-made law. It's precedent. It's going back to the earliest 18th or 19th century understandings in the 1800s of what assault means and tracking it right through to see whether that judge-made concept still makes sense. Let's um, also then go on to standards of proof. Um, that's, that's an area where, as you say, the, uh, the law admits uncertainty of, of various kinds. And so they've got uh, you know, beyond reasonable doubt or the balance of probabilities. But what do those, what do those phrases actually mean? Or, or do, they get, do they get routinely defined in, uh, somewhere? Mm -hmm. or, um, uh, or are they, again, interpreted more or less case by case? Wonderful question, and there are, there's not much help from the courts. So let's take the civil standard on the balance of probabilities. Some people would say that means more likely than not. In terms of the criminal standard, beyond reasonable doubt, some people have attempted to define it, and the High Court in the 1970s said, we're going to stop defining it for juries and for the courts. What we are going to say is that it's different to the civil standard. It's more than the civil standard of on the balance of probabilities. But what beyond reasonable doubt means is something that the juries and the judges can work out for themselves. Um, and that's not helpful at all. The case, case of Green that led to this decision was a judge attempting for a jury to explain what beyond a reasonable doubt meant in terms of the thinking process someone would go through to try to identify something as being a doubt, a reasonable doubt, and then getting yourself beyond a reasonable doubt. And the direction went on for a good page or so and didn't make much sense and confused everyone. So the court said, we're going to stop judicial officers attempting to do this. But what does that mean? The lay decision maker is left without guidance. They're not saying it's 50%. They're not saying it's 70% certainty or 80 or 95% certainty. They're not saying anything to their juries. They're just saying that you will deliberate on the evidence individually and collectively and come up with an understanding of whether this is beyond reasonable doubt or not. Where does thinking about unknowns and uncertainties sit within the law? Is it an active field of investigation? Is it a sideline? How does that play well, I think out? statutory interpretation is a really central field mm -hmm. for trying to eliminate uncertainty um, and think about what's known and unknown. And it's a reaction to the fact that we try to write down law to make it more certain. Some things aren't written down. The English Constitution in 2015 is not written down. So it requires the courts to interpret it. But in most modern criminal justice systems and civil law, the civil justice systems, we write things down in legislation and statutes and rules. So because we, we're starting to do that, to try to eliminate uncertainty, um, you have to interpret those words so statutory interpretation is where you actively try to pursue certainty. Mm -hmm. And it's back to the problems 
um, that you can dream up. How do you interpret a list in a, a statute? How do you interpret whether a statute applies in this circumstance? So how do we make sense of all of this? Well, two options. You can't just rely on interpreting the words linguistically, semantically, with a whole range of textual analysis. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't give you enough certainty. It runs out quite quickly. So the predominant approach in Australia and many other jurisdictions is to say, what did Parliament really intend? What was the purpose of that phrase in that statute? Why did they write that in the law? And it's, it's a richer understanding of what the words mean than just trying to work out what the words mean. Is there anything that we haven't covered that um, uh, you'd like to talk about in terms of how law deals with unknowns? Um, I suppose there's one other area that really intrigues me and many people in the criminal law about unknowns, and that's risk and decisions about incarceration and release from incarceration. So you might be thinking that most of the time you're, if you're convicted of an offence, you might get some parole and be released early for good behaviour if you're assessed to be a good enough risk to be released. Sometimes you might stay in prison for the entirety of your sentence and then you're released after that. There's a new concept that Queensland and Western Australia and New South Wales and Australia have been playing with. And that's to keep you in prison after the end of your sentence because you're deemed to be too, too dangerous to release. Sex offenders who have offended violently against adults or any sex offence against a child or a violent offence which has used weapons and a whole range of um, other aggravating factors. The Attorney General can make a, an application to keep someone in prison even though their sentence is up. It's been deemed to, to breach human rights law at the international level. Australia has ignored that finding by the UN Human Rights Committee and people are incarcerated, not because they've committed another offence, but because they've deemed to be certain that there's too much risk there. Interestingly, it's a different standard of proof. Oh. It's not on the balance of probabilities. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's often expressed as there being enough cogent evidence to suggest that this is um, a satisfactory decision to make on the evidence. Mm. That's a great conundrum to leave us with. Yeah. Thanks very much for yeah, uh, was great. generously being allowed to be interviewed and uh, it's been terrific. Thank you. I hope I've been certain enough. <laughs>